I better get that that sorted. Um, <laughs> awesome. Hi. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, as you heard, my name is Izzy Douglas, and I'm a geospatial specialist at Strategic Data Warehouse Management Science in New Zealand. Um, and yeah, I work in the elevation team. Um, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Andrew Jacobs, um, who is a geospatial developer who works in the base mix team. Um, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about LIDAR. Um, hopefully from the talk you'll, you'll start to learn a bit more about how the elevation team does the QC checks on the LIDAR. And then also we're going to talk about a new application that we've just developed and made publicly available, which we use for QC. Cool. So LINS mainly gets its LIDAR um, through the National Elevation Program, which was set up in 2016. It's a partnership program between 10 regional councils and LINS. Um, the aim is to capture nationally consistent elevation data that has high spatial resolution and accuracy and is freely available um, under Creative Commons support. Um, just to note here um, that the program is past the procurement stage now, so um, we are just receiving the data and publishing the data at this stage. Cool, so the map in the middle, it shows the general progress that we have of uh, publishing the data. So the green areas are uh, the LIDAR that has been published and is available for the public. The yellow filled in areas um, is data that is coming soon. So this could mean that the survey companies are are still processing the data, or maybe we are going through QC still with it. Um, maybe it's failed QC and we need it to get it resupplied from, from the suppliers. Um, and then the yellow hash is the area that is still in capture. Cool, so you can see that 55% of the country has been covered with available <coughs> or published LIDAR data. Um, we are aiming to get to 80% by next year. Uh, about this time last year, we were still under 20%, so we've had a lot of data come through the process in the last year. Cool, so you probably know a little bit about what LiDAR is now, especially from the talk previously, but it stands for Light Detection and Ranging. And for the National Elevation Program, it is captured from an active sensor that's mounted to an aircraft. So as the aircraft flies over the landscape, it sends out an active pulse, and that pulse reflects off surface features, then back up to the sensor. So this is the kind of uh, light uh, signal that you would get from, uh, that, well, that the sensor would capture. So you can see that one pulse, when it reflects off multiple surfaces, it creates peaks and they create points. So for one pulse, you can have return multiple points. And a collection of points in a 3D space is termed a point cloud. Cool, so uh, this is a point cloud in 3D, and each point can have multiple attributes, um, which is applied to the raw point cloud during processing. So for example, classification, which represents the, makes the point represent the surface feature. So you can see that in the image where the buildings are cream, the ground is orange, and the vegetation is yellow. So we publish two raster products that are derived from the point clouds. So the first one is a digital elevation model. Um, it is created from the ground points only, and it reflects the bare earth elevation. The second one is a digital surface model and it is derived from all points excluding noise. Um, so this is ground features as well as above ground features like vegetation and buildings, etc. Cool, so because it's a partnership program with councils, the councils are the ones that hold the contracts with the suppliers. So we get the data from the councils uh, we run it through our QC process to make sure it's consistent with base specification and consistent between suppliers and regions. Um, if it fails, it goes back to the survey companies for resupply, but if it passes, it moves on to publishing. So we publish the data on two different sites. 
Uh, so the, the point clouds in the survey report uh, are published on open topography, and the digital elevation models, digital surface models, and the tau index is published on the Linux data service. Okay, cool. So a really important role for LINs in publishing data is quality control. Um, our analysts uh, in the elevation team perform a large number of checks to ensure correctness and consistency um, when we go through our QC process. Um, and this is the general flow that we, that we go through. So we download and we prep the data, and that's usually like file management stuff. Um, and then we run some checks on the metadata, so that's uh, generated from like GDAL info for the rasters or LAS info for the point clouds, um, and that's mostly automated. And then we look at the, the data itself for both the rasters and the point clouds, and then we check the horizontal and the vertical accuracy for both products. Um, so a lot of our checks are manual and require skilled judgment from our analysts to perform, um, and in fact, the whole process can actually be done manually, but it would mainly be spell checking. So we use automation to increase QC efficiency, uh, to provide consistency between analysts, and also so that we can get almost a near coverage uh, within a data set. So can we, how many files can we touch <laughs> during QC? Uh, so when I started, the uh, automated scripts for the QC process were already established, um, but it required running a lot of different scripts and different software, um, and it was quite uh, confusing, I guess. Um, and so I was really clean, uh, keen to clean up the scripts and make them a bit more efficient, um, and so that's when I talked to Andrew about it. Uh, kia ora, I'm Andrew. So shortly after I started at Lynn, I met Abby and she was asking for some help with debugging some of the existing scripts that they had in the elevation team. And we quickly realized that there was quite a lot of potential to improve um, some of that automation that was there. Um, so we then set up uh, weekly sort of pair programming sessions to just go through and look at what we could do to improve the state of the automation scripts that they had. Um, so, as Abby said, there were there was a lot of automation there, but it was uh, it had sort of evolved organically over time, and there were a lot of different things in uh, different pieces of software or in different um, programming language. So there was mostly a lot of Python, but some of that would be scripts you'd run directly. Some of it was QGIS plugins. Some of it was ArcPy plugins for ArcGIS. There was some R in there. Some of the Python would use post just queries, there was just a whole really wide range of stuff. Uh, there were also quite significant performance issues with some of them, for uh, some of them they would take many days to run scripts. Uh, they would also have really different output formats and they'd go to different places and it just required a lot of manual work after running these things to like shepherd all of them through for the analysts. Uh, so what we decided was that we'd bring it together to make a single Python CLI application. It would bring all of that functionality together in one, and we chose Python because that was, uh, most of the code was in that already, as well as it's the most common language that's used within location information, which is the area of Lynn where we work. Cool, so during the meetings with Andrew, we identified the functionality of the existing scripts that we wanted to keep, um, and what to focus on when redeveloping. So um, at the time, so this is about a year ago when we kind of first started the project, um, we were getting a lot more region scale data sets coming in, um, and so it was taking a really, really long time to process the data, um, and so we wanted to focus on reducing that processing time. But another focus for us was also reducing the amount of software that you just heard Andrew <laughs> spout off that we were using um, just to make it simpler for the analyst team to make it faster to run QC. Um, Within Linz, we have a strong culture of utilizing open source software and open sourcing the code to the public, and so that is something that the project provided an opportunity to do. Um, it also allows survey companies to run the, the, the code if they want to before providing us the data. We've already given it to one of the survey companies, and that's been really, really helpful, which is cool. 
So the data is available at, uh, or the code is available at github.com slash lens slash LIDAR testing. Um, yeah, so here you can see the number of different, this is for that initial uh, checking the metadata stage of the QC. So you can see the number of different scripts that were required to run previously. And these times here are for a, a sample data set of a thousand point cloud <coughs> tiles. Uh, but some of the region scale data sets that the elevation team were receiving could be up to 40,000 tiles. So this on the left hand side that previously that could take a day or more. Whereas in the worst case now for that sort of really big data set, it might take about an hour. Um, so it's much faster, it's much simpler, and there's just one single output. Uh, so this is that uh, the command that we implemented with that with. Uh, so it's a, uh, the overall thing is a, a Python CLI application. Uh, and then with a series of different subcommands, this is the check data set command, which is the largest, it's the first we implemented and it's the largest one so far. So that takes all of the files that would have been supplied by the survey company, so that's a series of uh, point cloud files as well as a series of raster files for the DEM and the DSM, and then it basically gets some information about each of those files. For, for the point clouds, that'll be running uh, LAS info from LAS tools, for the rasters, that's DEVEL info, it passes that in uh, to a Pydentic model, so we get really nice typing uh, throughout the rest of the code, as well as nice sort of runtime error messages if there's some problem with passing some particular property. Um, and then all of that is done in parallel uh, using con the concurrent features library in Python standard library. And that parallelization was probably one of the biggest sources of performance improvement that we saw. Um, the other one would be just sort of changing from how some of the scripts have been written previously to avoid uh, writing intermediate files out to disk and just generally avoiding just minimizing the amount of disk I.O. that we were doing as much as we could. That seemed a lot of them were, it's just you've got a whole lot of data and you're just reading stuff from them and then you just want to write out as little as you can to make it go as fast as you can. And so then we bring all of that together into a single geo package file that has QGIS symbology embedded into the geo package so that then that's ready to view in QGIS for any of the analysts and it's consistent for whomever is picking it up to look at the metrics. Cool, so here's a video of the output that we get from that check data set command. Um, so you can see there, as you drag in the geo package, it shows you the layers that are within it. So the three uh, layers for the point clouds, DM, DSM. Um, and uh, so there's a layer per product, and each file is represented by a polygon feature. Uh, and the bounding box is based off of the coordinates, um, and each feature has a whole bunch of attributes, which you can see here um, when you click on them. Um, yeah, and so we've also embedded QGIS symbology for each layer, makes it consistent every time you drag it into QGIS. Um, there's a summary table that is a non-geographic table, but it summarizes per product and, um, and yeah, lists a bunch of checks that we do per, per product. And it's just been really convenient to have it all in the same place. Cool, so we also have automation um, in the point cloud data quality steps. Um, so one example that we, that we do during that QC process is we create rasters to show the density of points um, and that's what all of these scripts do. Um, so each script filters to a different classification, um, which is on the left. Um, and basically we use these to see where all points are generally positioned um, and it's, it's a more performant way to, to view the point clouds step rather than just viewing them in like arc or something. So I'm sure it would crash if you tried to drag in a thousand point cloud tiles. Um, so these scripts use a combination of R and arc uh, GIS scripts. Um, so you can actually see that there's, there's different ways so we would use like a combination of them. So it took, it took about three hours to run the process. Um, we were jumping into different softwares. 
it was, yeah. Um, and then for the uh, ARC one, uh, the R ones, we'd have to jump into QGIS and then run a plugin which would like add symbology. So <laughs> it was it was a lot. Um, but yeah, so the density raster command that we created does all of that um, in much less time. Uh, yeah, so this is the density raster command that implements that functionality. So a lot of the code was, we were able to completely reuse from the initial check data set command that we added. So all of the uh, code that does the parallelization, that's just using the exact same functions. Uh, so it takes arguments in for what different types of density rasters you want to create, uh, and then uses either PDAL or LASD tools for those depending on which of them they are. There's some that were better in PDAL and some that were better in LASD tools. Uh, and then outputs them as a series of GeoTIFFs uh, with uh, VRT virtual raster file built as well, as well as QGIS symbology sidecar files so that, again, if you bring them into QGIS, you get that consistent appearance. Yep, and here's a, a video of that. So there are all your density TIFF files in your VRT folder, and then you can see the QGIS symbology as well as the main VRT and the overviews. Um, yeah, so each pixel, uh, it represents the count of points in that area, um, which you can see I'm highlighting here. And we run five different uh, rasters generally for a whole data set for QC. Um, so you can see here that there's grounds, buildings, low vegetation, uh, noise, unclassified, and pulse density. The main thing with the first four is just to get an indication <coughs> of where all the points are. And then if we find something that's kind of a bit weird, like maybe there's a, there's a, a void where there's clearly ground, we'd then have a look at the point cloud and see what's going on. Um, so we don't use it as like a definitive thing. For the point cloud, uh, for the pulse density raster, we use it to find data voids in the, in the point clouds themselves. Um, so over Areas like water and thinning over vegetation make sense and that's okay, but if there's a void that's like over a building or over, I don't know, a big area, then that's something that we'd want to check out in the point cloud. Um, so this is an example of that. It kind of looked funny. There was thinning in a weird area and it turned out to be a glass roof. So the points would have scattered instead of going back up to the center. So it made sense. But that's the sort of stuff we kind of look for. Uh, so this is uh, an extra command that we added. It's not one that gets run directly most of the time because the density raster command outputs VRTs for us, but it's basically just using, exposing that same functionality as a separate command if that's ever something that the analysts want to run directly. So it uh, is basically just a wrapper around GDAL build VRT and GDAL addo. So it creates uh, a VRT for each 300 tiles and then creates a parent VRT of those child VRTs and builds overviews on that parent VRT, which is a bit convoluted, but <laughs> we found that that was the best way to get really good performance in QGIS for this particular type of uh, one band data that seems to work really well. Uh, and as you can see, that's with 40,000 tiles and it's just, it's no problem at all. It's perfectly performant and smooth. Cool, so the, overall the work that we've done to improve QC automation has gone really, really well. Um, it went a lot faster once Andrew became, came on board. Um, uh, so we've managed to improve performance, which means that the overall QC process is a lot faster, checks are comprehensive, uh, commands are easier to run, we finally have progress bars in <laughs> terminal, um, outputs are easier to use the code's more understandable and maintainable. Um, there was just so many positives that came out of this. Uh, so yeah, we're really happy with the work so far. Um, and as you can see, we've got lots of ideas um, for future developments and for this slide. Um, but yeah, we're really excited to make the code publicly available and open source, and we really look forward to any feedback of suggestions from external users. Yeah, so I just wanted to thank Andrew for coming on board with this project, because I think it would have probably taken me another three years to get to the point where we are <laughs> now, so that's awesome. Um, I also want to thank Emery Beck for letting me use some of your awesome visualizations during the presentation. Don't miss this presentation uh, tomorrow if you're really keen to learn how to do it yourself.
Um, also, if you have any questions, you should be able to find us at the Lynn stand. We'd happily go through code or anything if you're interested. Um, I didn't put it in the slide because it didn't look pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm happy to go through it. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs> check, check. Um, so uh, my question's about um, how generalizable is the code that you've released on GitHub? So uh, if you've got, if you've got uh, some line about data and you want to do similar processes, uh, you mentioned that you had embedded Symbology in that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's configurable or would you need to get your hands dirty and get into recoding to make it useful in each specific scenario? Yeah, you just have to use the QML file and change the symbology, save it, and then if it's the same name, then it would be fine uh, to run uh, for the, the symbologies themselves. Um, yeah, I guess it's worth a note for the check data set. It's all based off of the LINS data, uh, the base specification. So all of the checks that we're running is so that it passes that. So if, it, if you're wanting to run it on other data and you've got different uh, specifications that you want to check, then you'd have to go into the code and change those things. Thank yep. you. Yeah, I, just to add to that, I'd say, so we've made it open source primarily to be to just work in the open, which is a really important thing for Linz as part of the public services, that sort of public service mandate to um, work in the open wherever possible. So we're sharing what we have and would love for people to use it, but it, we haven't necessarily designed it or intended it to make it a fully generalizable application that will be fully customizable for everybody to use yet. But if anybody who is keen on using it, we would absolutely lo love your feedback and want to talk and work out how we could integrate any customizability or anything that you might need into it. Gotcha. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'll stand up so you can actually see me. <laughs> Hi. Um, uh, data collection with LiDAR is becoming cheaper and easier to do and becoming more common across various industries. So off the back of that, do you have any concerns about the data collection actually changing over time and potentially re uh, resulting in different formats? Um, yeah, we're kind of already seeing that, um, hearing stuff about COPSI formats for point clouds and that. Um, at the moment, our base specification stays the same and it's for the National Aeration Program. So that's what we are uh, going against or going with. For now, um, that can change in the future. It sort of just depends on um, why the data was captured, where we're getting the data from, and the contract that whoever got the data with is being fulfilled or not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious about uh, where you decided to use PDAL and where you decided to use like LAS tools and you know what drove those decisions? Yeah, um, I guess this can be an Andrew question. <laughs> what do you <laughs> um, That is a really good question. I would say we would be using LAS tools primarily for, um, what's the word, uh, consistency with the previous QC scripts that we used, because there was a lot of less tools was used. Um, and so it was just easier when we were developing things to just, we know we're gonna, we were just making sure that the new tooling uh, produced the same results as the previous tooling. Uh, where possible or we're implementing new things, we'd probably err towards PDAL. And I think for a lot of the places where we're using one or the other, PDAL could probably do what Les Tools is doing, and we'd ideally want to probably move towards and standardize towards that. But where we are using Les Tools, it's probably just for yeah, that consistency with how things have been developed previously. Just made it easier when we were doing the redevelopment. Yeah, sounds reasonable. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> cool, thanks everyone. We're out of time now, but if you have final questions for Ed, Maria, or Abby and Andrew, they're all still around, so feel free to come and ask. Um, we have lunch now out there, and then at 1.15 we go back to more concurrent sessions between this room and the other room. So one more round of applause for these guys. <laughs> Thank you.